Y'all still having a good time? Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, next I want to introduce you to this lady who was nice enough to uh, let me into her house. I went to a teaching at her house, and uh, she was an excellent hostess. Um, she's also really smart and kind of an expert on the subject that we're talking about today. So uh, without further ado, because we got to keep it moving, I'd like to introduce you to Paige Knight. Too loud, too soft? Okay. A uh, louder? Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, all of you, for coming here. Thank you so much, Miriam and Occupy, for um, refreshing my Hanford life with your presence and with the work that we've done, the little bit of work we've done together. Um, thank you all for caring enough about cleaning up the. Uh, most contaminated site in the Western Hemisphere, not in the world. Uh, and thank you for caring about, and for some of us, loving the Columbia River. The Columbia River is our lifeblood. Uh, thank you for wanting a different, uh, wanting different values. And uh, that is uncontaminated rivers and land for future generations. That's the value that we need to instill in everybody. The Tri-Cities has become my second home over the last 20 years since I've been working on Hanford issues. Um, I got involved was a really flaming, angry radical. <laughs> and that usually happens when you first find out about Hanford. Um, and then I began educating myself with the help of people and getting really connected in some networks around the country even, which just really uh, fed my soul and told me I'd come uh, to the right home in terms of my issue. Um, let's see. Uh, so for the past 20 years, I've been working on Hanford Watch um, and we're or working through Hanford Watch. Uh, some friends and I started Hanford Watch uh, in about 1992 when the red oil tanks were uh, in the news with the possibility of uh, exploding or imploding. And it was a pretty serious issue and that's when Ron Wyden, Senator Ron Wyden, put them on a, a, a tank watch list, which was uh, quite a contribution he made at that time. Uh, that watch list has, is no longer needed uh, because of some of the cleanup that has happened. Um, I have come to know and understand in my uh, journey with uh, Hanford Cleanup that you cannot change a place unless you love a place. And I have become so in love with this land, with this desert, with the river up here. Uh, I have uh, certainly toured Hanford, Hanford many a time and there's just so much beauty in it when you can look beyond the buildings and some of the contamination that you know is there. And I, I trust my Native American friends from the Umatilla tribes and other tribes when they say this can be cleaned up. Sometimes I think they have a magic knowledge of what we can really do. Um, so I love this land. I also, in my uh, role as a member of the Hanford Advisory Board, I was on uh, sort of the founding set of people who started the Hanford Advisory Board, which is a body of uh, 32 seats with, uh, we each have uh, at least one alternate or two, so a pretty big body, whose uh, job is to uh, advise the Department of Energy, the Department of Ecology, and the uh, EPA, which are make up the tri-party uh, who started the tri-party agreement, which we are uh, under their jurisdiction or their, their laws right now or their timetables. And of course, those timetables are uh, guesses. They don't always work, as you all well know. Uh, I love the people that I have come to know uh, and appreciate here in the Tri-Cities that I have worked with. I haven't worked with all of you, but I do just appreciate that I have had to learn to open my mind to other points of view to understand that we can agree to disagree on some of our uh, views about nuclear energy and nuclear waste and contamination and health effects, etc. I have learned so much from the people in the Tri-Cities. Um, that's part of what it means to love a place and the people if you're trying to change something. We need a next generation of uh, 
advisory board members, we need a next generation of Hanford activists because often on the advisory board anymore, if you were to come to a meeting and look around, you would see that many of us are uh, in uh, beyond the what is considered the prime stage of life. Now, I don't believe that's true, but uh, we are getting older and we need young people involved. And that's one of the reasons that, uh, or one of the gifts, I would say, that has connected me with uh, Occupy Portland. They came looking for information, wanting to be educated, had already begun to educate themselves, asked intelligent questions, showed great curiosity, and wanted more. So I've been very, very happy and refreshed to uh, find speakers uh, you know, to come and, and illuminate them and, and educate them because I believe that we can't solve this problem unless everybody is educated. And that includes in the schools, that includes in our towns, through our newspapers. Education is key. And I really applaud the Hanford uh, Occupy group that has educated themselves so well so far. Um, the other thing that I want to say is that we cannot minimize the dangers of radio, nuclear, and chemical contamination. Now, people often forget that there's a lot of chemical contamination in our tanks and in our ground up here too. Uh, we cannot ignore the dire consequences of not safely storing, not getting rid of, because I don't think there's any such thing, but storing all of the waste at Hanford uh, storing it in a safer uh, environment. And that's what the vitrification or glassification plant is supposed to do. That's really the purpose of dry cast storage. I would much rather see all of our nuclear uh, 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 materials solidified and put in dry cast storage so that it is not able to leak into uh, the river, into the land, and into our health and into our lives. Uh, Oregon and Washington uh, have worked, uh, are, are actually connected in all of this because of the Columbia River and because of uh, the air and because of a lot of other things. We are connected, we are connected too because our congressional de delegations from Washington and Oregon over the 20 years I've been involved, have worked as much together as they can, and certainly there are disagreements, to make sure that Hanford cleanup is a priority, that funding comes for it, and that the uh, workers are safe, that, the, uh, that things are done correctly. And they're not doing the best job. We know that from Miriam's uh, very pointed comments at the beginning of this event today. And, and they are the truth. Uh, we need to work together as citizens sorry, to keep the region and national focus on cleanup at Hanford because as more and more of the uh, nuclear weapons and defense sites are cleaned up, the congressmen and the people in those areas say, oh, we're done, forget about, you know, we don't care about the rest of you, we got, we got ours. And that's not what we need to be doing. I uh, come from a generation that uh, was, uh, was milk-fed the idea of the common good. One of my, uh, uh, my, I'm a high school teacher and my supervisor calls me a little socialist. And I mean, that's a stretch of that word, but we have to work for the common good. And that's been said today by many of the native elders and leaders. It's been said by many people. Uh, this is generational. We need to protect uh, as many generations as we can possibly protect in the future. Um, so, in working together, I want to remind you, and this is, this is the main reason that I uh, am doing what I'm doing. Uh, Hanford Watch really uh, was founded on the principle of we want public participation. We want people participating in the choices and the decisions that are made. That's uh, something that is really uh, part of my heart and soul. And each one of us, I want to tell you, everyone here even if you don't feel like you can handle all the information, even if sometimes it's overwhelming, each one of you, just by getting educated and talking to somebody else about it, makes a difference. And together, each one of us who are interested in cleaning up Hanford, make a, uh, uh, the, the difference that we make is multiplied exponentially. Uh, now I would like to end with reading uh, some words of a poem that has meant so much to me over the years. I, I don't know where I found it. I, there's no author. Uh, and I may need help of somebody doing... Can I do this? Oh, let me do this. 
How do I do this? I just need this in here. I can't. Oh, there we go. Okay, got it. So, so does this work? Okay, the start of heavy. Um, so uh, this poem, I hope I don't cry in the middle of it. It, it moves me very, very deeply. Uh, and I want you to listen, especially to the beginning couple of stanzas, um, because you will get the drift of why I am reading this to you. This is called the standard remembering of our ancestors in the times of nuclear peril. I ask you to breathe and open as we do when we remember times that are very far past. Times that are very hard for us to imagine. Hard for us to go back to the time when the poison fire was made on the planet. We in the 22nd century are accustomed to the danger. But the people of that time, mid 20th century, were so innocent dangerously innocent. And as we remember the old stories, we remember how it began in the press of war. Oh, our ancestors in the press of war were seeking new and larger ways to kill. And they opened the nucleus of the atom and with great effort and with great acumen and with great applications of their brains, they made and exploded the first nuclear weapon and the project, God forgive them, they called Trinity in the desert of Almo Gordo. And the stories come down to us of a president called Truman at a place called Potsdam, receiving a telegram, baby safely delivered. And that baby was the poison fire. And then in that very year, in that very month, Yes, the poison fire was first used as weapons against great cities of a great people. And we know the names and you can say them in your heart. We shall not forget them. Hiroshima, Nagasaki. A quarter million people burned at once, then people sickening slowly, for that is how it destroys, slowly, hidden. And then our ancestors of that time the stories tell us this is hard. They took that poison fire to make electricity. We know how easy it is to share power with the sun and with the wind and with the biomass, but they took it from the poison fire and they used it to boil water. Oh, the lords of arrogance were riding high then. It was a dark time, the time of nuclear peril. And the signs of sickening grew. And at every step along the way, the poison fire proliferated. And there were epidemics of cancer. And there were epidemics of viruses and immune deficiency and deformity and stillbirths and sterility. Oh, we know them well now and we know their source. But for those ancestors, it was mysterious whence came the sickenings of spirit and flesh. And some, sensing how these were connected with the poison fire, with huge accumulation of its wastes, wanted, it, wanted to wish it away. And the governments tried to bury it. There were places called Carlsbad, Yucca Mountain, deep holes half a mile down. They wanted to bury it as if the earth were not alive, not in my backyard. Their pain and their despair were so great, they wanted it out of their sight, out of their minds. We remember that in the story, because it was in those dark times that our ancestors began to meet and take counsel, groups coming together in where they lived. They looked into their hearts and thought, we can guard the poison fire, we can overcome our fear of guarding it and be mindful. Only in that way can the beings of the future be protected. They remembered us, how clear it is to us today. But it was, it was new in that time. What inspired them? What did they draw on in those closing years of the 20th century to hit upon this idea to inspire themselves and indeed then to carry it forward? So with that, I 
dub you all, and I mean this sincerely, we are all nuclear guardians. We have this, this uh, burden upon us, this, this gift to give future generations, and we must pass down this nuclear guardianship to ourselves, to our children, and to future generations. So thank you.